Today we'll be <clears throat> speaking about the matter of anatta and rebirth. First we'll talk about anatta and then we'll go on to discussing rebirth. If one understands anatta sufficiently, it will be quite easy to understand rebirth correctly. The, <clears throat> the feeling of self occurs naturally and instinctually at first. Then it is taught, reinforced, conditioned more and more. This process of teaching, educating the idea, the belief in self develops until it ends up in the belief in an eternal self or eternal soul or what have you. This is this kind of belief and teaching is quite common. When the Buddha arose in the world, however, he taught the opposite matter. He taught about anatta, anatta, not self. For the primitive levels of civilization, the people living in the forests and, and caves, they all believed in spirits and powers and, and ghosts and, and selves. And so this, this is a very common belief. It happens very easily, occurs very easily to the human mind. And so in relation to all those spirits and angels and demons and things, people develop all kinds of ceremonies and rituals and, and rites which they perform in terms of these spirits and selves and all that. Then as any civilization or culture or, or tribe or whatever develops, then the the beliefs about self, about spirits also develop and so do the corresponding ceremonies and rituals. And these develop until in India, in the time of the Upanishads, Upanishads, there developed the highest teaching, the most fully developed teaching about the self, which is that there is this self which is reborn over and over again or reincarnated or what, whatever and becomes slowly purified through this long succession of births until it is, it is completely good, it becomes the best possible self and then stays in that eternal state for the rest of eternity. And so <clears throat> this very common primitive belief in a self, in spirits, then develops until the height of that development is the belief in some eternal self, such as in the Upanishads. This belief in self and soul from India spread all over the place in, into other cultures and civilizations. And since most in, um, in all the other cultures there was already a, a receptivity for this idea, people are, were already thinking in these terms though on a less developed level. And so other cultures and civilizations accepted this, this teaching from India and so it spread all around the world. Even in Thailand, for example, this teaching about this self that is reborn over and over again spread to Thailand long before Buddhism came and because of the, the beliefs that existed in the Thai people before that time they were very receptive and accepted this more developed teaching about the self and in this way the, the Indian teaching of a eternal self has spread all over 
So this, in India, they developed the highest, most developed teaching about the self in the period of the Upanishads. And this belief in self was most, it developed most fully within the, the sect or tradition within Indian culture that is now called Vedanta. This was the, the highest ideas about a self which they called the <coughs> Brahman or which is comparable to what is also called Paramatman. This was the highest teaching as represented in Vedanta. When the, at the time of the Buddha, or just before the Buddha, this was considered to be the most perfect, most modern, most up-to-date teaching about the self, that which was contained within the Vedanta <coughs> tradition. When the Buddha appeared, he taught something completely different. First of all, he taught that this, this Atta thing, this belief, was wrong. It, it wasn't true. There wasn't really such a thing as they were talking about. And second, that the belief in Atta, the illusion, this illusion, was also the cause of Dukkha. That all Dukkha is based in belief in self. And so the Buddha in, taught Anatta or not self because of these two reasons. One, because the, the teaching of Atta is wrong, and two, because that belief in Atta is the basis of all dukkha. And so the Buddha had to teach something completely different. We should also be aware, though, <coughs> that in other groups or traditions, there was some understanding of Anatta, and they were talking about it somewhat, though in in somewhat small and often insignificant ways. There was some inklings and some murmurings about anatta even before the Buddha, but it, even though they talked a little bit about it, they always kept something, they always hung on to something as atta. So they might, there was maybe some talk about, say, that the, the body was not self or material possessions were not self. And in some of these minor ways, there was talk about not self. But in spite of that, there was always something that was kept aside as, as the atta. And then and it was believed that this atta then would be reborn over and over again, becoming better and better until reaching a state of purity. Let's look at how this, to understand anatta, let's take a look at how the feeling or sense that there is an atta occurs. It's basically an instinctual feeling or sense that there is a, a self in life. This, this happens by itself. And this is a survival mechanism that we can find in all, all organisms. So this, just this instinctual feeling that there is a self occurs. Unfortunately, this is incorrect. Although it's instinctual, it is, it is false because the instincts are not based in, in true knowledge, in correct knowledge. They're a naturally occurring type of knowledge which is far from infallible. In fact, it's based in, in ignorance. And so that is instinctual sense of atta or self is coming from ignorance and is incorrect. But nonetheless, that sense of self we can see is necessary for survival and so we can see it occurring easily, spontaneously in, in all living organisms. But nonetheless, it is, it is false. Now let's look at the second level of the development of Atta. The child, the infant, is born at first and with just this very, after birth there is at first just this very 
basic instinctual feeling of self. It's, it's not very big, not very developed. But then the infant is surrounded and constantly making contact with all kinds of things which are giving, giving rise to feelings and notions of good and bad, of agreeable and disagreeable, positive and negative. And all these surrounding things start to encourage, because of ignorance, the child doesn't have much knowledge. And so, because the child doesn't have knowledge to know better, all these things encourage the, that instinctual belief in self or feeling of self to grow and become stronger and stronger. This, is, this occurs through the power of, of ignorance. And then next, the third level of this development of atta, of self. Once it is developed to the second stage, then there is the, the part of atta that is, or that the further development that is educated, that is taught. Um, this is the cultural conditioning every child receives from parents, teachers, um, other, other cultural elements, and including religion. And so from all these, these, these teachings, all this instruction the child is given, further develops and strengthens the belief in self. And so, until it becomes even a religious conviction that there is a self or soul, and so it grows to its, its fur fullest development, this third, third stage, through all the cultural conditioning of parents, teachers, and even religion. So, notice carefully that there are three, three main causes or conditions for this belief in Atta and Self. The first is the instinctual condition, just that basic natural sense of, of I, of a self. Then, the second condition are all these surrounding things which stimulate in positive and negative, good and bad, agreeable and disagreeable ways. This then condition, develops that atta further from just the natural instinctual level to what is becoming now ignorance, wrong knowing. This is encouraged through all the, the various positive and negative factors influencing or which the child is, is confronted with. And then that sense, that ignorant sense of self that is developed is further established and solidified and deepened through the, the teaching to believe in this thing, to actually, through our cultural, the instruction we receive, that we're taught to believe in this. And this occurs in all homes, in all families, in all religions, in, in the schools, in the temples, in the monasteries, the synagogues, everywhere, the churches, this then belief in self and soul is very firmly established and driven into, into the child's mind. And so then that this ignorant understanding grows to its fullest extreme. So all of us have a basic foundation that we of this sense of self and then this is developed through all the information we're all the things we're taught every language in fact has the has self buried within it all languages have some word for self or ego soul whatever we want to call it and many of our words imply a self and so we can't use language without strengthening this, this belief in a self. And so this is so heavily conditioned into all of us, beginning with that just basic sense or feeling of self, that it's very difficult to let go of this, to, to abandon it, to give it up. And so even we find in Buddhism, we even find talk of self. This is partly just because of the limitations of language. Even Buddhism that teaches not self very clearly, still has to use languages that talk about self. 
They use words like I and mine. And so it's often very difficult for our ordinary people to understand this. And even in other cases, just be, we have to talk about in Buddhism, we have to actually use the word self, atta, directly. And so sometimes there's even talking about our self or the self needs to do this and that. This is just the limitations of language. But you should know that whenever you find the word self in Buddhism, that we should take it to be a self that is not self. Anywhere in Buddhism you come across the word self. The self that is being, it's just using the word, but that self is not self. So in Buddhism, or with all Buddhists, are forced to use the word self. There's no way of getting around it. But the meaning, when Buddhists use this word self, they mean the meaning is of a not-self, something that is not-self. For example, a very well-known quote of the Buddha says, self is the refuge of self. Atta is the, the refuge of Atta. But this, to be understood correctly, has to be that Atta is not a self, that Atta is not-self. This has to be understood. So when we say self is the refuge of self, what it means is that this self which is not self has to be its own refuge. It has to have this, this not self self, this self which is not a self, has to have sufficient wisdom and understanding to realize that it's not a self. And when the, the self can see that it isn't a self, then all problems will cease. And this is what is meant by self is the refuge of self. That self is not a self. It's not self. It's not soul. Besides the, those who teach atta and then those who teach anatta, there's a, a third group that teaches that, that there's no atta which is Atta, they'll, they'll agree with that. But they also say that there's no Atta that is Anatta. In Buddhism, we can say the self is not self. But there's another group that says there's, there's not anything that is self and there's not anything that's not self. They just say there isn't anything. These are the nihilists, those who, who deny the existence of, of, any, of everything. And this is a third group, which is different, of course, than the Buddhist teaching. So regarding this matter, we can, we can observe three, three kinds of, three approaches or three teachings. The first approach teaches, says that there is a self in the fullest meaning of the word self. They say whatever, what this thing self means, they, they believe in that completely. This is the first. The second says that this thing we call a self is not self. That there is something there, there is, there is something. That, so when we say self, we're referring to something, but that something is not self, it's not a self. The third group denies that there's anything at all, just says there's nothing. There's nothing at all exists, there's just complete emptiness. And this is the nihilists. So we can see the three groups. The group that teaches the existence of a self that is really a self in the fullest meaning of the word self or, or soul or ego or whatever word we, we, we prefer. Second, that the thing called a self is not self. It, 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 you just can't find a, a real self in there. But we can, we can use the word if we need to. And then the third group that says, there's nothing there at all. There's just nothing at all. There's just nihilism. And these are the, the three groups or three teachings regarding the thing called self. So, <clears throat> if you'd like, there are three, three words or three terms that 
apply to these three teachings and you, you are, it would help you to remember them. The first, of course, is Atta, A-T-T-A, Atta. This is the teaching of a self that really is a self, is completely a self, completely a soul. That's the first. Then there's the middle teaching of Anatta. There's the thing called a self, but it's not self. And then the other extreme, the one extreme is the teaching that there's a, a self, there really is a self. And the, the other extreme is Nirata, Nirata, N-I-R-A-T-T-A, Nirata, which is there's nothing at all. That there's that thing called a self, there's nothing even there that can be mislabeled as a self. There's nothing whatsoever. So there's Atta, which is one extreme, the complete self. Anatta, the Buddhist teaching, the middle teaching, the non-extreme teaching that there, that self is not self. And then the, the other extreme of, of, of nihilism, of nothing existing anywhere. If you can remember these words and understand their meaning correctly, it will be of, of great value to you. So we can see that one of these positions or, or teachings is to take the positive extreme, to take the positive to its extreme. The other is to take the negative extreme, and then there's one which is in the middle, which doesn't go to either extreme. So the, the positive extreme is to, to take existence and say that there is just complete, things exist completely, fully. And this is called satsata titi, satsata titi, often translated the belief or view of eternalism. And then the other extreme, or then in the middle, is the teaching that that thing everybody is calling a self or ego or soul, there's something there, but it's not self. This is the middle position. This is the, the correct understanding. It's called sama tt, right understanding or right view. And then the third is to take the negative extreme, to take negativeism to its extreme. And this is called natika tt, natika tt, or <clears throat> that nothing exists whatsoever to say there is no existence, no nothing existing anywhere at all. So there's the positive extreme, satsadatiti, the negative extreme, natika titi, and then samatiti, the right understanding in the middle that that things exist. There is existence, but it's not self. So not to go all the way into affirmation or all the way into denial. Now please be very careful when we talk about this natika titi, that negative extreme of, of nothingness, of nihilism. This means nothing, there is nothing, nothing existing at all anywhere. Nothing, none of us exist. Nothing exists. That's nihilism or the teaching of nothingness. Please don't confuse this with the Buddhist teaching of sunyata or voidness. Voidness says that there are things, there is existence, but nothing existing is a self. It thinks everything is void of self. There are things, but they are void of self. So be very careful to see the difference between nothingness, which is there is nothing, and then sunyata, which says things are not self, are void. Things are void of selfhood. Sunyata, voidness, is very different than nothingness. We hear sometimes the word emptiness, and it's often confused which, which of these meanings. Is emptiness meaning nothingness? In that case, it's not Buddhist. Or is emptiness the same as voidness? Empty of selfhood. This, this, then it can be called Buddhist. So note it, 
be very careful about the difference between natika, nothingness, and sunyata, voidness. So, once again, there's the word nati da, which means the state of nothingness or the state of nothing. There isn't anything, nothing at all. This is nati da. I was mispronouncing it, nati da. Completely different than sunyata, sunyata, voidness. There are things, but they're empty, they're void of self. So, nati da, nothingness, sunyata, voidness. Things are existing, but they're, em they're void of self. And here is nothing exists at all. Nati da, sunyata. So, <clears throat> let us stress over and over again that do not confuse nati da, nothingness, with anatta, not self, or sunyata, voidness, or datata, thusness. Don't confuse the misunderstanding, the wrong view of nothingness, with the correct understanding of anatta, sunyata, datata, not self, voidness, thusness. In the correct, in anatta, sunyata, datata, there's no denial of things, of existence. It just says that all these things, there are things all over the place, but all of these things are not self, they're void of self, they're da ta ta, they're just, just thus, without any self. So please make sure you, you understand this, otherwise you won't be able to, you won't have any clue about what Buddhism is. So next we come to, to the question of what is anatta? What, what is anatta? If we, we've been talking about anatta, well, what, what are the things, or what is the thing, or whatever that is anatta? First, we can say that body, mind, body, mind is anatta. Body and mind are anatta. The body is anatta, and the mind is anatta. Some, for example, <coughs> the body. It's just a body, it performs its various functions. There are certain physical functions that are necessary for life, and the body just does these. But, and that is anatta, just the functions. It's no self is required. The mind is anatta. The mind also has all the functions which it must perform in order to sustain life. But in all those various things the mind does, there is no self just the mind doing its, its, its work. So, anatta is the body, the body and mind are anatta. The body just feels, it has various sense organs and the ability to sense various things. This occurs because the body contains a nervous system. It doesn't happen because there's a self that feels. It's just the nervous system and all those chemicals and electrical impulses and all that. That's all not self. And then there's the mind, the non-physical part of life, doing all its various functions. And all of those take place without any self being required. There's just body and mind, two things. They can function perfectly well. There's no need for this third thing, this, this thing people call a self. It's just body and mind. This is what is anatta. If we talk in, talk in terms of two things, then we say body and mind is anatta. We can also talk in terms of five things as being anatta. These are the five khandas or the five aggregates. The five khandas or aggregates are just a, a slightly more refined <coughs> understanding um, look at this thing we call body-mind. The first khanda is body. So the body can just do its functions and there's, it doesn't need a self to do it. The body just does its, its work by itself. That's rupa khanda, which is anatta, which is not self. Then the other four khandas are all mind. Body and mind. Mind, being more complex, is, can be seen as four aggregates. The first of these is vetana or feeling. 
feeling just happens. Feeling is a function or process that the mind does, and it happens by itself. It doesn't need anything else. It doesn't need a self <coughs> to happen. Feeling is anatta. The next kanda, sanya kanda, perceptions, discriminations. This this just happens by itself. It happens within and through itself. It's not dependent on some atta. So sanya is not self. Then sankara kanda, conception, conceiving, thinking, emotions, all that. These occur. They're func a function of mind. Or just we could just say a function which happens by and through itself. And this is not self. And then vijnana kanda, the sense consciousness. Another function which is not self. It's not dependent on some thing we might call a self for its for its occurrence. It just happens through and by itself. All five of these kandas, body, feeling, perceptions, conceptions, and sense consciousness, all this is anatta. And now we come to the thing we call life. If we want to see two things, then there's we've got body and mind. And body and mind are anatta, or there's five, the five khandas. And each of these khandas, or all five of them together, or any combination or non-combination of them, is anatta. The five khandas are anatta. Or if we want to just use one simple word, we can just say life. Body and mind is life. The five khandas is life. And life is anatta. If we want, just want to say life, life is not self. Look, look, in, look carefully, examine life honestly with an open mind and you won't find a self in there. Just, it's just life. It doesn't depend on this extra, this extra self. Now we come to the word jitta, jitta, which is usually translated mind, sometimes consciousness or mind heart. You can translate it however you want. But the jitta is the thing where all, all of life, its, its significance is, comes down to the jitta, the mind. All things have to be known through mind. And so for this reason, because of the centrality of mind, of consciousness, there are many who say that this, this mind is atta, is self. But in Buddhism, we see that the mind is just capable of all this awareness, all these functions. It can do all these different things. That's just the way the mind is. The mind is like that. But nonetheless, the mind is anatta. Although it can do so many different things, all those functions are just just like that. They're just what they are. They're thusness. There's no self to be found in any of it. So the thing called jitta is also anatta. And now we come to the, the highest, the highest thing that the mind can realize, the highest thing that the mind can, can penetrate. And this, in Buddhism, we call nipana, nipana, or if you wish, you can call it the, the, the heaven or kingdom of God. Whatever you want to call it, this highest thing that the mind can know, can realize, can be aware of, that too is anatta, that nipana. It's just thus. It, it, it's just what it is, but it's, it's not a self. There's no self in it or related to it. But some, some religions say that this, this highest thing, which the mind can, can know, they will say that this is the Paramatman, or the Brahman, or the eternal soul. But in Buddhism, it is understood to be just anatta. There's such a thing, it's real, it's genuine, but it is not self. So, <clears throat> we can see that, if we look, we'll see that all things have within them we could say a virtue or quality that allows them to do whatever it is they do. All things have within themselves the quality that is able to perform 
the characteristic function of that thing. All things, whether they're material, physical, or mental, psychical, whatever, have a mechanism within themselves that allows them to perform their characteristic function, the function for which we, we name them. All things have this, this, self -ex this function within them. But that function or that mechanism that through which they perform the function, this is all not self. It's not some self doing or controlling the function. It's just a naturally occurring mechanism at work. A very, very simple example of this, which we can take from the material realm, and this will be an example for, for all things, both material and mental, is there's a kind of weed or grass, which is very common here at Suan Mok, and it exists in the West also, where it's a kind of grass, if you touch its leaves, it closes up like this. It, it has this mechanism, that just this common plant or grass has this mechanism within itself to close up. Now, those who believe in self will hold that there's a self in that plant that makes it close up. If, if, you, if you hold things that have selves, then you have to say, well, the grass has a self, and that's how come it, it, it closes up. But in Buddhism, it says there's no self involved, it's just this natural mechanism, and then it, it closes up. Even in plants, which would be very difficult to say that they have minds, like we would say about a human being, they still have this, this mechanism. It can do this, this very strange and interesting thing, but it doesn't involve a self. As soon as we say that something has a self, then we're no longer talking about Buddhism. If there's any talk of a self, it's not Buddhism. It's, it's becoming animism. As soon as we start talking about selves, what we're, we're talking about animism then, the animism that puts selves in plants and, and rocks and rivers and everything. So now we can ask, well, then if there's no self, well then what is this thing we call a person or a, what is, what is the person if it's not a self? We can just say it's a bunch of ingredients various parts compounded together, mixed together. And that's all. We can, we can talk about mind and body if we wish. wish. Various, very simple, the two primary ingredients of a person, mind and body, or the five aggregates. Or we can talk in terms of the elements, both the physical and non-physical elements. We can just see that what we call a person are these these parts, these ingredients, these components, and then these are, are brought together, they're put together, and then we've got a person. But if all those little parts, elements, khandas, whatever, are not self, well then the, the combination of them is also not self. Just because you stick a bunch of little things together doesn't mean you've gotten a self just because you can glue them together or, or hold them together for a little while. It's so whether this, this, this person, this life with, with the body components and the feeling components and the perceptions and the thoughts and the sensory consciousness, all these different ingredients come put together, we call a person. But all those ingredients and elements are, are not self. And so the, the combination, the person is also not self. So then we can ask, if, if so, then who acts, who is the actor, who does all these actions, all these physical and verbal and mental actions, who is, who is the actor, who receives the result or the fruit of action or what is sometimes called karma, who receives the results of, of action, of karma, who, who receives, who experiences happiness and, and dukkha. It's, it's quite simple. 
And in fact, we don't even have to use the word who. We can just see that the mind thinks. It has the ability to think. So the mind thinks. And as a result of that thinking, there is an action, maybe a physical action or a verbal action. And then that action takes place and leads to some sort, some result. There is a result, there is a reaction arising from that, that action. Now, the mind that thinks is not self. And the body that acts is not self. The mouth that speaks is not self. So that action is also not self. It occurs, there is a genuine action, but it's not self. And then the reaction to that action is also not self. There's no who doing all this. It's just the, the mental thought, the mental action leading to a physical action or verbal action leading to a reaction, one conditioning the next. And all of those things are, are not self. The reaction, we can just say once there is the reaction, whatever comes into contact with it, that's who experiences it. But this is speaking a little bit sloppily to say whoever makes contact with that result, that reaction, that's who experiences it. To answer the question, who experiences the results of karma, which is people are asking this all the time. But if we look more carefully, we'll see that there's one, one mind thinks, has the intention behind the action. And then that reaction is experienced by a completely different mind. From this moment to the next, it's a new mind. It's not, it's this mind and then another mind. And so the mind that experiences the effect or a reaction it's, it's a different mind. It's not the same mind. It's not the self. It's not a who. Who implies self. And so, whether it's happiness ex that's experienced or dukkha that's experienced, it's just a mind experiencing it, but it's, it's not the mind that, that did it or that thought it. It's different minds after another going through these various experiences. And the, the feelings, the experiences, the, the mind, all of these are anatta, are not self. Now we come to the question, <clears throat> then what is, what is reborn? What is reborn? You can ask who is reborn if you like, or ask what is reborn? This is the next question. But forgive us if we speak a little bit crudely, in fact, this question is, is ridiculous and crazy. It's really a silly question to ask what is reborn or who is even sillier. Because if this in Buddhism, there's, there's no point in asking such a thing. As we've been pointing out so far, if right now, right here, sitting here, there is no atta, well, then how could there be some atta that goes, something that goes and gets reborn? If right now it's anatta, there's no atta anywhere, then what, there's no what or who to go and get reborn. So this idea that there's one person getting reborn, and this is what rebirth or reincarnation is all about, the idea that I, or you, or whatever, is going to go get reborn somewhere that the same person is born again. This is, this is ridiculous. If all of this is anatta, then there's nothing that can go and get reborn. So in Buddhism, there is no such thing as rebirth or reincarnation. There is birth. This is obvious. There's birth all over the place. Things are getting born all the time. You can see birth all around us. There's all kinds of things constantly being born, but there's no rebirth. It's never the same thing being born a second time. Every birth is, is new. So there's birth, there's loads of it, endlessly, constantly. 
But in Buddhism, there is there's no birth, rebirth, no reincarnation, because there's there's nothing whatsoever to be reborn or reincarnated. There's not a lot of time remaining, so let us take a quick opportunity to say that this this thing called the person or the individual doesn't doesn't exist. There's no there's no such thing. There only occurs within the thought that there is a person or an individual. What is what is taking place is various various processes arise and, and pass away over and over and over again in this in one or not in one but in a, a, a larger process. And so at there is a, a temporary or coincidental coming together of, of functions of processes or of a, of a grouping. We could say there's a, a temporary grouping that occurs from time to time. And that's what we call the person. We see these parts come together and we say, oh, that's a person, that's an individual. But this, this is temporary. What's really happening is just a process of cause and effect. These different things occurring, these different things being born, arising out of causes. And this then process or stream of cause and effect goes on and on and on. But the thing we call a person is just a momentary grouping that is, it doesn't last. It, it doesn't have any reality. It's just a illusory person. So this is why in Buddhism there is no it's a teaching of no man or no person. It's a teaching of dependent origination, this process of cause and effect, of, of these things just continuously arising out of, out of causes, causes dependent upon previous causes, unfolding on and on and on in a, in a stream. This is, this is what is occurring, but there's no person in that. So when there is just this process of, of cause and effect, there is no rebirth. There is nothing that is repeatedly getting born. There is birth, but no rebirth. So we should look at this word birth a bit, the meaning of the word birth. We can see three, three primary, three basic meanings of the word birth, or three kinds of birth. The first is the kind of birth that everybody knows about and the kind that many people, it's the only one many people know about. This is physical birth. The body is born out of the womb, and then it grows older and older and older and reaches a certain age and then dies. That's physical birth, the kind that leads to, to physical death and getting buried or cremated or whatever. That's one kind of birth, physical birth. The second kind of birth is mental. It happens within the mind through the process of dependent origination, through a series of causes leading to, leading to a mental birth. Whenever there is the thought of I am or I have, I own, I want, I get, I, I exist, any of these I, I, I thoughts, this is mental birth, birth within the mind. The third, and this is one that some people are aware of, the third one is very difficult for most people to understand. The third, well, the second kind we can say is birth through attachment, birth through attachment or birth through clinging. The third kind of birth many, is very difficult for many people to understand. When we, when any of the the ayatana, if you remember this word from the first talk, the ayatana, whenever they perform their function, that is birth. And when it stops functioning, then it, it ceases or is, is, it goes out, it's quenched. So when the eye sees, performs the function, its function, then eye is born. When the eye is not performing its function, then we say eye ceases or eye quenches. When ear performs its function, ear is born. It stops functioning, ear, ear extinguishes. 
and the same with nose, tongue, and so forth. Whenever something does its function, it's born. And when it's no longer in any moment, when it doesn't do that function, then it, it ceases, it ends. And so, if you, if you can see this, all the, all the senses and all the sense objects and all the things associated with them, the ayata nikatam, those 30 things we discussed in the first talk, all of them are born, in, they're being born and seizing, born and seizing over and over again as they do their function and then the function stops. So all these things are occurring like that, but each time it's a different thing. And they're just all these functions, these things, these processes, these activities happening over and over again. But it's always a different thing. It's not the same, there's no same thing involved that holds it all together or that we would, would call a self. It's just this, this sense function, that sense function, occurring and ending, occurring and ending. And this, this is an, the third meaning of birth. So you should <clears throat> understand the three kinds of birth. Physical birth, the mental birth through attachment, the birth of I, of ego, and the third kind of birth, this birth of whenever there is a, a sense function, a sensory function. So <clears throat> there are some, there are many who believe that in this body there is, when the body dies, there's something that remains, and then that thing goes and gets reborn in another body. This is the, the belief that arose in the Upanishad era, and then it was accepted by many, many different religions. It's quite, this belief is, is very common, but it is not Buddhism. It has, this isn't the Buddhist teaching. <clears throat> There's, when Buddhism, the f most fundamental principle in Buddhism is that in what we call a person, there is no person. We just use the word, but there's no person here. So to say that this person goes and gets reborn is completely fallacious. There's, not, there's no person here, so there's nothing to go and get reborn. There's a birth here, there's a birth there, but it's a completely different person. It's not this person getting reborn over and over again or this self getting reborn because there's no self here. There's no soul here to go get reborn a second time. There's just birth and birth and birth and birth all over the place of all kinds of different things. <clears throat> so we can, whether it's say the body, physical birth, this body is born and then it dies, and another body is born and dies. But the first body is not a self, so there's no that any other bodies that would be occur in some, some later time are not a rebirth of the self because the first body didn't involve a self. Or the mental kind of rebirth we talked about, the mind in which I is born, the I conception is born once, okay, and then that fades away, and then another I conception is born in a different mind. This mind, where the one I conception occurs, and then the next mind, even if they happen in very rapid succession, it's a different mind. It's not the same mind. It's not the same thing being reborn. There may be some similarities which confuse us but it's a different thing happening. It's not rebirth. It's just there's a birth, a mental birth, a mental birth, a mental birth, sometimes in rapid succession, but different births, different minds. And that the ayatana, those sense functions, each time the eye functions and then ceases and then functions again, it's a different eye. Can you see how this the, the physical, just the physical eye itself, from one function to the next, it's not the same eye, or not the same ear, not the same nervous system, not the same brain. It's, there's the constant change, so it's never the same. The function, the, these functions are repeatedly happening, 
but it's never the same eye or ear or nose, tongue, body or mind that's doing the function. But when we, when we have to talk about it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to explain. So whether it's the physical birth or mental birth through attachment or just the, the birth of the sense experience, of the sense activity, the, the function is always brand new. It's just a birth. There's not something that repeats. There's no repeating thing, either in phys physically, mentally, or in the sense activity. It's just a birth, a birth, a birth, a birth. This, this is why we say that there is no rebirth in Buddhism, just birth. The basic fundamental teaching of Buddhism is not self. We can say non-person, non-soul, whatever, non-ego. And so, how could there be something that is, is reborn? What? There's nothing to be reborn. There's just birth. However, or unfortunate, <clears throat> in, in, in one place, for example, there was a, a foolish monk who wasn't paying much attention and he was going around saying that the Buddha teaches that vijnana. Now, usually vijnana means the sense consciousness that arises at the ear, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. But also, many Hindus at the time believed that the vijnana was a kind of spirit that was getting reborn. So this guy was walking around saying that the vijnana is reborn. The vijnana goes and gets reborn in some other body. And the Buddha said very distinctly that this is wrong, don't ever say such a thing. This has nothing to do with my teaching whatsoever. You're completely messing up the whole thing. There's no, the vijnana does not go and get reborn. The sense consciousness does not go and get reborn. And if you think the vijnana is a spirit, well, that's for sure off off the teaching. However, and th this is very clear in the scriptures, however, somehow there are a, also, if anybody's read some of the, the texts, there occur references to, in a very kind of common la language, saying, well, this person went and got reborn there. So there are, there are these things, these references in the scriptures, and so, of course, we've got people arguing about these things all the time. And so, as we said earlier, the thing here isn't for you to believe, but to find out for yourself which is, which is true. In, in our understanding, the most fundamental teaching of Buddhism is the teaching of not-self. The Buddha came back to this over and over again. But if you wish to give more importance to some of these references to something like rebirth, you can do that. But the thing really to do is examine and find out which one is correct. Find out for yourself which is correct. Just by citing the scriptures, we can't prove anything to you. And so now we come to the most important matter. The Buddha said that in the past as well as now, I teach only one thing, dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. That's it. That's all the Buddha's teachings are about, dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. And so we don't have to waste a lot of time talking about whether there is rebirth or not, because the fundam that's not a fundamental question. The fundamental matter is dukkha and the end of dukkha, the elimination of dukkha, the quenching of dukkha. If there's any kind of birth, there's going to be dukkha. Whether it's just birth or whether it's rebirth, there's going to be dukkha. It does, so it doesn't matter what you call it. The matter, it's just a question of dukkha gets born. Dukkha is born. So if the, the fundamental concern or question or objective is dukkha and the end of dukkha, we don't worry about the trivialities of this rebirth thing. What is important is then how, how to quench dukkha, how to end dukkha. And this is why the Buddha taught anatta. 
The Buddha taught anatta as the way to, to realize this truth fully enough is the way to end dukkha, to quench dukkha. And so the Buddha taught anatta because that's crucial and central for the ending of dukkha, which is what the Buddhist teaching is all about, how to quench dukkha. And so it's necessary to teach anatta. And arguments or discussions of things like rebirth are, are academic. They're not central to the primary issue. And so we can wrap this up by saying that if you understand anatta correctly and completely, then you will discover for yourself that there is no rebirth and no reincarnation. And that's, that's the end of the story. And so to, we'll end today's talk here. It's now food time and have to go and eat the food that the doctor ordered. <laughs>